So today, the word that I've got for you is called slavery. I like to speak about slavery today. But not the slavery of the Indians and the, the Africans of many years ago, but the slavery of a Christian. The slavery that the Bible states that we are slaves unto God. And we're going to begin first of all in the book of Romans chapter 6 verse 17. Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Previously, uh, you, you let yourself be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation of do, to do right. And that was the result. You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. So today I would like to speak about slavery. And the thing first of all to understand uh, about the Christian slavery is that uh, being a Christian and being in slavery is not bondage. Amen? Uh, it, is, it is talking about a life commitment. Uh, it's talking about a life that is given totally uh, to an object or to a person uh, or to uh, a being. Uh, and that is slavery. What it is referring to um, Paul here he, he gives an illustration and he uses the term slavery, uh, but it is just an illustration. Another illustration is worship. What do you worship? Uh, or what, what are you, who or what are you a slave to? So it is an illustration. Um, it's something that you are bound to, something that you cannot escape from. Uh, and the thing to understand is that as a human being, whether you are a Christian or not a Christian, you are a slave to something. Uh, every one of you is, 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 is um, committed to something or to someone. And when you look at Paul's illustration, he makes it very, very clear that you were a slave to sin. Uh, so you did what was wrong. And you, basically, that's speaking of the world. You were a slave to the world. And then he said, but when you received the Lord, you became a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as a human being, not just a Christian, you can never belong to yourself. At no stage in your life, as much as you, we feel like we have control, you never ever have control. You're always living for something. Uh, your existence is for a purpose. And the purpose of your existence or the, or the reason for your living or the thing that you're living for, that defines what you worship. And it also defines who is your master. Amen. Amen. I just got two questions which I'd like you to ask, and I'd like you to repeat it after me and then answer it in your heart. The first question is this. I want you to repeat after me. Who is my master? Repeat Who? after me. Who is my master? Who is my master? Now answer that question in your heart. 
Who is your master? Now most of you here, because this is a church and you're Christians, you're all going to probably say, well, God is my master. Or you'll say, the Lord Jesus is my master. Which is fine, he is your master. But the second question I have for you is this. And you need to think really carefully about this one. Who do I serve? Repeat that after me. Who do I serve? Who do I serve? Amen? Now those two questions, you think they're the same, but they're not. Who is your master is who do you belong to? But who do you serve is who are you committed to? Amen? And that, you, before you say, well, I'm, I'm my master, but not, before you say the one who I serve is the Lord Jesus Christ, first, before you say that, prove it. How do you know you serve him? How do you know you serve him? What is it in your life that you can say, because of this that I do, I serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Because if you say he's your master, that means you have to serve your master. But in your life, what is it that you're doing in your life that you serve him? Because you cannot, you can only be a slave. If you're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ, that means you're still a slave to sin. Because you cannot say, well, I serve myself. You can't. Because your life is always, unless you're somewhere in a, in a planet by yourself and there's no air, there's no nothing, it's just you, then you can say you serve yourself. But unless, so as long as you're living with people, so as long as you have ambitions and you have hopes and you have dreams, you are serving something. So are you serving the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you truly a slave to him or are you still a slave to sin? So before you say, well, I serve the Lord Jesus Christ, are you sure you serve him? There has to be an evidence. There has to be, there has to be an absolute thing that I can say, I serve him. If I am a manager and I have employees, those employees, they can say, well, if someone asks them, who is your manager? They can say, well, Pastor Lionel is our manager. And if they say, well, how do you know he's your manager? Well, we work in this company. We have the uniform every day, five days a week. We're in this place. We're do there is an absolute thing they can say because we do this. That is why we can say we serve him. But as a Christian, you say I serve the Lord Jesus Christ because he is my master. What evidence do you have right now, right now in your life that you serve him? You have to be able to say to answer that question. See, I know that you work in whatever company you work for because I know that you go to work every day. It has to be in the same way, that same evidence that I serve the Lord. I can say I serve the Lord because not just because he's my master. Every one of us can say that. But I have my evidence is that every Sunday, every during the week, I am preaching his word. I am sharing his word with others. Every opportunity that I get, I am I'm telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ. At work, I'm trying to tell people. Uh, wherever I go, any opportunity that I have, I'm asking people, would you like me to pray for you? That is my evidence. I have the evidence that he is my master because I serve him. Week in, week out, what evidence do you have? Look back just for the past few days. Just say the past two days. And how many evidences do you have that you already served him? Because if you cannot absolutely say, this is the proof that I am serving him, if you cannot say that, then who were you serving? Because you have to be serving someone. Amen? Amen. That's what Paul was talking about when he says that now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching. You have to, a, a servant is someone who gives themselves wholeheartedly to their master. Amen? Amen? You see, the thing is here, it's, it's all about what you do. It's about what are you doing with your life. Can your life stand before judgment and the Lord can say, truly, my son or my daughter, you have served me well. We know by the principles of God and the, the parables that the Lord gave, the, 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 the most famous parable is the one of the three servants, that the Lord is interested in the one who serves him. He's interested in what you do for him. See, he has given to you life eternal. He's given to you the free grace of salvation. 
That is all free. That is, there's no requirements. But to increase and to go further in your Christian walk, there has to be the evidence of service. Amen. Amen. Here's another question. Which I just want you to write. What in my life am I doing that I could count myself a slave of God? Shall I repeat that? Everyone got it? What in my life am I doing that I could count myself a slave of God? Amen? Amen. Can I say something to you very plain? I'm not, I'm not condemning. But this is very plain. According to the Bible. If you don't serve the Lord, then you serve the world. You serve sin. And if you serve sin and you serve the world, you're serving the devil. Because he's the father of the world. And if you live your whole life serving the world, then you're going to hell. Amen? Amen. That's pretty black and white. Simple as that. Either you serve the master, Lord Jesus Christ, or you serve the world. And there's no two other ways about it. Amen. Amen. Uh, so it's about what are you doing in your life? What evidence do you have in your life? And you've got to be able to prove it. That yes, I serve the Lord because of this that I'm doing. And not just one thing, but you have to be able to look at your whole life and prove to yourself how are you serving the Lord in your life? How are you serving the Lord in your career? How are you serving the Lord in your education? With your finance? How are you serving the Lord with your children? With your, uh, with your marriage? In every area of your life, you need to be able to see how am I serving God? Because this is it, right? If I, can say, if I cannot say that I am serving God, for example, in my career, that means God is not glorified in my career. If I cannot say that I'm serving God with my finance, that means God is not pleased with my finance. If God is not pleased with my finance, why would he give me more? Mm. Amen. Amen? Amen. Why would God bless me when with the little that I have, I'm not serving him? That's why with everything that you have, you have to be serving the Lord. It's about the things that you do in your life. That is what counts. And I just want us to go through that same chapter, uh, that, that, those same verses again. And just to emphasize on a few things, let's look at verse 16. It says this, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? Amen? Amen. You become the slave of whatever you choose to obey. In other words, whatever you live for, that is becomes your master. You become a slave to it. Amen. Amen. Let's go on to verse 17. That one's pretty clear, isn't it? Verse 16. Mm -hmm. It says, thank God, verse 17, thank God once you were slave of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching. Again, I want you to look at the word wholeheartedly. It is about giving your whole heart. Being a slave to God is about giving your whole heart to God. And again, if we just go back up to verse 16 again, you see it says uh, on the second, the second line, well, let's just read it again because we would have different Bibles. Let's just read verse 16 again. It says, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin which leads to death or you can choose to obey God. Now, just two things I want you to notice. The same thing. It says that you choose to obey. And again, uh, later on it says, or oh, you can choose to obey God. It is an option. See, being a slave of Jesus Christ is not, I am born again, therefore I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. No. You're born again, therefore he is your master, but you're not yet his slave. To become a slave of God, it is about what you do. You have to choose to be a slave. Amen? Amen. You don't just inherit it automatically. You don't just inherit the blessings of God. People think because, they, because I go to church, because I pray, because I give, because I do all the religious stuff, that I automatically qualify for the blessings of God. No, you don't. God doesn't have to bless you just because you're a Christian. You have to choose to stay in the Father's house. The prodigal son, he chose to take what he had and to leave. And therefore, there was no blessing for him. 
And then he chose to come back to his father's house. If you read the story, he says very well that I, he came to himself. That means he realized in his own mind that this is foolishness. And he chose to go back. He said, I must go back to my father's house. It is what you do that makes you a slave of God. Amen. Amen. Let's carry on with verse 22. It says this, but now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you can do the things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. The word I wanted to focus on is this, now you, now you do those things that lead to eternal life. Again, emphasizing that it is the things that you do that leads you to eternal life. It is not just because I'm a Christian. It is what you do. Now it's the things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. See, see, it makes it very clear that you don't have holiness and eternal life just because I am born again. You have it because of the things that you do. Wholeheartedly you're committed to being a slave of God. Amen? Amen. See, when I ask you again that question, who do you serve? All of a sudden, that question becomes a little bit doubtful. Amen? Amen. And being a slave of God is not something to be ashamed of. Look, uh, if we go to, no, you don't need to go to it. Just make a note of it. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Just make a note of it. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he's, he starts off a letter. And in the letter, the very first things that he says is, I, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. In Titus chapter 1 verse 1, again it's Paul and he starts off again saying, I, Paul, a slave of God. Amen? It's not something to be ashamed of. It's the very first thing. It is the badge of a Christian that I am a slave of God. It's the very thing that you should be most proud of. I'm a slave of God. See, he doesn't say, uh, I am Paul, I am, uh, I've studied, I've done all of it. He doesn't qualify himself. The only qualification of being a Christian is, I, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. That tells everybody who you are. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Again, in James chapter 1, verse 1, James is what? Well, he starts off the letter and he says, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. As Christians, we need to be slaves to him. We need to be totally committed to him. And that commitment, you need to understand that slavery on itself, by itself, when you think of slavery, it speaks of bondage. It speaks of being trapped. It speaks of not having a choice, being stuck or being imprisoned. That is how you have to see your Christian walk. That I am stuck with God. I cannot get away from him. I am locked here and I can never escape from it. Amen. 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 And that is the Christian walk. And it is something to be proud of. Amen. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 19. With that, says this, verse 19, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. Why? Because you're a slave. Mm -hmm. Verse 20, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. And we're emphasizing on verse 20, it says, for God bought you with a high price. God bought you with a high price. See, what that is speaking about, a lot of people don't realize, when it says that God bought you with a high price, it's speaking of slavery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? It's speaking about, see, we just say, oh, Lord, salvation. No, it's speaking about slavery. You are born again to be a slave. You are born into slavery. You're born to be a slave of Jesus Christ. That's why it says I, that he paid a high price. If I could just give an example, if I want someone to serve me and I go to a marketplace and I ask some men 
and I said to them, I need someone to cook for me, to clean for me, to look after my garden, and all of these things. And then they say to me, how much will you pay? And I said, I will pay you so much. And they come, and seven days a week, they're serving me. I am paying them. They're not my slaves, they're my servants. Or they're my employees. That's totally different. But Jesus here, he's, and the Bible here says that Jesus paid the high price. Okay? That's not talking about employment. It's not talking about getting a servant. The, the, what he is talking about is, and again, if we go back many years, but back in the days of slavery, if there was such a place during the time of slavery called the slave market, and in the slave market, you go into that place, and there are many cages with slaves in them, okay? And then each cage is owned by a master. Now, I do not go to the cage and speak to one of the slaves and say to them, I want, I want you to be my slave. It doesn't work like that. Amen. Amen. Who do I go to? I go to the master of the slave. And I say, I want that slave to be mine. Amen? Amen. And then what does he say to me? He says, well, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Mm. And he says, well, how much is it going to cost? And the master says, well, it's going to cost you blood. And Jesus says, okay, I'll pay the price. Mm. And then that slave has got nothing to do with him. It's the transaction that is done between Jesus and the master of the slave. Nothing to do with you. That is salvation. Okay, and when I've paid the price and that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ upon Calvary's tree, I've pay, he paid that price and then the transaction is done and that slave becomes my slave. Mm -hmm. See, he was born into slavery. The moment you're born into actual natural birth, you are born into slavery. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus Christ comes into your life. He pays your master because you are slave to sin. So he pays sin that's why the Bible says that he became sin. Okay? He paid the price that sin required so that you can then become his slave. So at no point of that full transaction did you ever belong to yourself. Amen. 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 Those Christians who think that, you know, my life is my own life. I do what I want. I live what I like, want. I drink what I want. I, you know, you're a fool. You can't do what you want. You don't belong to yourself. You never have. You never will. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So you understand the process of what Jesus meant when he said that I, I paid a high price. It is by his right that you do not belong to yourself. He owns you because he paid the price for you. That is the price of salvation. That is why you are a slave to Jesus Christ. You know, when Jesus paid that price for you and you became his slave, what that means is that you are bound to him. You have no right to live your own life. You can go ahead and live in fornication. You can go ahead and live in adultery or commit all manners of sin. But you don't have a right to do that because it's not your body. Amen. A slave does not belong to themselves, they belong to the master. That is why Jesus never came to you and said to you, Would you want to come to me? He went to the master that belonged to that you belong to and said, I will pay the price for that person. Amen. 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 And a Christian who refuses to obey, who refuses to be a slave of Jesus Christ, is a rebellious Christian. Amen. Amen. And then you face the consequences of that. Why is that you rebellious? You say, well, it's my own life. I can do what I want. No, you're a rebel. Because you have a master. His name is Jesus Christ. Just like the prodigal son. He had a father which he was supposed to be submissive to. What did he do? He decided to take all of his goods and he left. And what is the thing that always happens to a Christian who refuses to be a slave of Jesus Christ? Destruction. You find that their life never ever ends well. The amount of people that I've warned them, I've sincerely warned them, I've said, be careful. Because what you're doing is going to destroy your life. And at the time they're thinking, well, it's my life, I can do what I want, I can live how I want. And soon after that, you hear news from someone else, look what they're doing now. Their life is destroyed. Amen? Amen? It's just the same as the Israelites who came out of Egypt. And then what did they want to do? They wanted to go back into Egypt. They wanted to go back into the slavery that caused them pain. Amen? Amen. 
The inspiration of this message actually came through a dream. Uh, but not my dream, it was a dream that Victoria had. And she came over to my house yesterday and shared that dream with me. She told me the dream two times. A few days ago she told me, but I never quite understood. But yesterday, last night, she came over to my house and we sat and she told me the dream that she had. And all of us, I didn't have to even pray for it. As she spoke the dream, the Holy Spirit was telling me exactly what that dream meant. And her dream starts off like this, just for the illustration. In her dream, it was her and Irvin. And they were together in the dream. And the way that it began is that uh, there were pharaohs, you know pharaohs, uh, kings. There were many pharaohs. And these pharaohs, they were speaking to Irvin and they said to him, if you come with us, we'll give you riches. We will give you wealth. We will give you success. And so Irving thought, okay, it's a good idea. So he came with the pharaohs. They brought him to the house, to their house. And before he knew it, they started saying to him, okay, all you need to do is to serve us. Just clean the house, do some mopping, do some sweeping, just look after, clean the windows, and you will have your riches. And so Irving started doing the windows. He started cleaning the whole place. And then before you know it, time goes on. And suddenly he realizes that he's become a servant. And then he's still, don't worry, you'll get your blessing, you'll get all the promises. And then time goes on further, and before he knows it, he becomes a slave. And then they start beating him. And they've still not given him the promise. They've still not given him the wealth or the riches. They've still not given it to him yet. But he becomes a slave to them. They start abusing him and beating him. Okay, and this was in her dream. And then later she also joined the pharaohs as well because of the promise of success. Okay, now once Irving realized in a dream that he didn't want this, this is not what he wanted in the first place, he decided to leave the pharaoh's house. But this is the process of leaving the pharaoh's house. You have to go to the house of the pharaohs and you need to tell them, I've had enough, I want to leave. But before you leave, they had to, in her dream, they had to beat Irvin almost half to death. He came out of the house, he was bruised, he was cut, uh, blood was coming out of his body. They had to beat him half to death. So he left the house, that's the process. But once you leave the house, it's not finished yet. Because then you need to cross a river, a flowing river. This is all in a dream. You have to cross this river, but this river, not just is it flowing, but it's got big rocks flowing along with the river and you have to cross over it. And then as Irving started cross over it, uh, crossing the river, the rocks will be hitting him and she knew in her dream that nobody ever gets through this river. Most people, when they try, they die because the rocks just hit you and you get washed away by the river. So the way that Irving had to get through that river is that he had to close his, uh, no, he had to look up into the sky and just have faith in God. And then he started walking through that river and those rocks would just go through his body. They wouldn't touch him. And then he got to the other side of the river, but it's still not finished yet. There were some benches, uh, circular benches, uh, some seats, and he had to touch the bench. And once he touched it, he was finally out. Okay? Now, Irvin had to go through that process. And then Victoria also went through the same process to get out. They beat her as well. She had to cross the river. And she had rocks beating on her, smashing her head. And eventually she had faith. She looked up and she just walked straight through the river. She touched the bench and she was out. Okay? But that's still not it. Because after that, there, were, there was buildings all over the place. So it's like an estate. And two buildings. And she started seeing, they started seeing pharaohs. Jumping out of building, they were chasing her. They were chasing both of them. They were jumping out of building, coming to them. And they started panicking, they started getting afraid. And Irving said to Victoria, listen, let's just hold on to each other. Look up into the sky and have faith in God. And as they did that, those pharaohs surrounded them, but they could not touch them. And finally, the dream was over. I want you to pay close attention to the interpretation of this dream. Does everybody understand the dream? Yeah. This is what the Lord showed me about the dream. Those pharaohs, they represent the world. They represent self-ambition. Uh, all of the promises the world gives you. You know, a lot of people, they leave Jesus. They don't submit to Christ because they see TV, 
They see celebrities, they see successful people, they see businessmen, they see uh, pop stars, and they see all sorts of things. Those are the promises of the world. You can have it too. You can be successful too. That's the promises of Pharaoh. That you see, see the thing, the, the, the deception is this. God did not tell you that you will be this person. The world told you it. And because the world told you that you can be rich, you can be a millionaire, you can set up a business and you'll be a millionaire, the world told you that. Did God say that? Did God say to you that you're going to set up a business and you're going to be a millionaire? No. Who put that in your mind? Pharaoh. Do you understand? It's people that have hopes and ambitions and they live their life to be something that God has not said that they're going to be. But it is a deception that comes from Pharaoh. I will, is that clear with us? And so then someone decides, you know what? I don't have no time to be a slave of Jesus Christ. I don't have no time for that. I want to be somebody in my life. And so they follow the promise of Pharaoh. But the problem with the promise of Pharaoh is that you, it's fine when you're in your bedroom and you have dreams and you're hoping and you set up a business plan. This is what I want to do. A, B, and C. I'm going to study. I'm going to, it's all good when you're dreaming. Okay? But the moment you start trying to achieve it, before you know it, you become a slave to it. Because you're struggling, you're fighting, you're battling, and yet you never... You see other people around you succeeding, and yet you're still stuck there. You've become a slave. Do you see that? Your whole life is now living for a hope that God did not promise you. Pharaoh promised you that. It's a deception. Is that very clear? And then the next part of the dream is this. Once you finally realize it, this is, this is not happening. Because you, you saw your friends doing it. You saw other people doing it. You saw other people in your age group doing it. Do, being successful. And you thought you could do it too. Because you followed that home. Eventually you realize, you know what? I'm struggling. I can't do this. And then what you finally do, if when you get there, you say, you know what? I give up. I need to go back to my father's house. And that is the church. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. But to get back to the Father, that is where the battle begins. Because you have to repent. See, what Irvin had to do, go to Pharaoh's house and say to him, I don't want this no more. That's repentance. You have to repent. And repent for Pharaoh. Repent for all of the things that you've been trying to do. And say, you know what? I have no more of this. But the re when they were beating him, that, is speak, that speaks of the difficulty of letting go. Because it's, it's intimidating when you've committed so much to something and you realize you can't do it. Letting go is painful. It's really challenging. And that is the beating that he was receiving. But eventually when he let go and then he left that place, he was battered and he was bruised. The bruise speaks of shame. It speaks of hurt. It speaks of regret. It speaks of the emotional pain. But you still have to leave that place. But then you have to go through a river. And the river and the, and the rocks that were coming, that speaks of the challenge of moving on. Because you constantly have, you're trying to live that lifestyle. You're trying to follow God, but you constantly feel as if you're being dragged back and as if rocks are coming and beating you. But the way to get through that is to keep your head up and to look to the Lord Jesus. And he will help you through and when you do that, those rocks cannot touch you. Despite the fact that you're seeing the water, you're seeing the rocks, you're seeing all the opposition, but they cannot touch you if your faith remains on the Lord. And then eventually you get to the, to the benches. You have to touch the benches. The benches, there was a circle. If you imagine that's a bench, then there's a bench here, a bench there, and a bench. So it's a circle. So you have to touch the bench to finally so that it will be over. And the bench represents a place of peace, a place of rest, a place of safety. And that is the church. Okay? But then, what happened next is the Pharaoh started coming out. Now, this is what that means. Anyone who quits the old lifestyle and, and decides, I'm going to commit to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's all good when you do that. And when you finally get to the bench, you finally relax. I finally made it. I finally left that old lifestyle. But then what always happens? All of a sudden, it could be in the night time. It could be in the evening. It could be even at church. All of a sudden, like an explosion, the temptation comes back. 
And that's the Pharaohs jumping back at you. They're chasing you, they're trying to grab you back. That's what the Bible speaks about when a, a someone gets delivered from an evil spirit. The spirit goes away for a while and then comes back with seven more spirits. That is a temptation. And it becomes much more stronger. And a lot of people, they get through the river. They touch the bench. Finally, they're out and their life is living straight for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when that temptation comes, those pharaohs chase you. Before you know it, if you submit to it, in a wink of an eye, you're back again in Pharaoh's house. And this time, you're stuck there for good. Except you keep your eyes on the Lord. You know, the, that principle is the same as what happened to Peter when he walked on the water. He had to keep his eyes looking on Jesus. What happened the moment he took his eyes off Jesus and he saw the water? He saw Pharaoh. He saw the temptations coming back and he thought, I cannot do this. Before you know it, what happened? He started sinking back into the water. And the moment Jesus grabbed his hand, he came back up again. Amen? Amen. That is what that dream is speaking about. We have to be a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only hope that you have. And being a slave to him, I'm telling you, remember what I said, it's being a slave in every area of your life. You need to be serving him in everything. Nothing in your life can be separate from him. Even your marriage, that is the most sacred thing, the most private thing that you could ever have in your life. You can do anything before people. But in a marriage, what happens between a man, a husband and a wife is sacred and is hidden between them two. But the Bible says even Christ has to be between you. Amen. Nothing can be separated from Christ. Are you hearing me? Amen. And that's what a slave is. Do you think that if you were a slave, back in those days when they had slaves, do you think that the master will say to the slave, okay, take a towel, go and hide yourself in the bushes and shower. No, he'll say right there in front of me, you shower. Because there is no privacy. Are you understanding me? Amen. The master will take a stamp and he will stamp the slave because you are my property. Just like but that goat is mine, that dog is mine, that cow is mine, you are also mine. And that is how a Christian's life should be. But it is not a slavery of bondage. It is a slavery of freedom. Amen. A slavery of eternal life. Amen. And the glory of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Some people think that being a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ is a thing of passivism. Um, by that what I mean is they think that committing your life to Jesus is for, basically is for wimps. Is for failures. It's for those Christians who they just had a waste of time. I ain't got no time for this. They think that committing your life to Christ and being a slave to Him. Uh, and I just wrote this down and I just want to write uh, read this the way that I explained it. What people think about those who are slaves to, of Jesus, they think that they're religious, they're too spiritual, they are nobodies, they achieve nothing, they think that they are poor, unsuccessful. And they pray all day and achieve nothing. That is what most people think about being a Christian. They think that you have to be poor, you get slapped about, you have nothing in your life. But that is not what the Bible teaches us about being a slave to the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's what they think. And I just wrote this down as well. that Those so-called Christians, they never have time for God or church. Because they're too busy. They think that being a slave of the Lord is a waste of time. Because in their life, all they are saying is, I've got to pay my bills, I've got to get my phone, I've got to pay my contract, I've got to do this, I've got to be successful, I've got to keep up with my friends, I've got to keep up with the world, and that is what they're focusing on. They think that being a slave of the Lord Jesus, you cannot achieve those things. Most Christians, in fact, in, and I'm sure mom and dad, you can agree with this, uh, in, in our language, Lingala, uh, and this, I was speaking with this with my mom a long time ago. Um, when we say, I'm going to church, often they don't use the word, I'm going to church, which is, Nazoki de Iglesia, I'm going to church. They use, Nazoki de which is, I'm going to pray. 
Do you see that? And they don't say I'm gonna, they say I'm going to pray. And most Christians they refer to it, I'm just I'm going to pray. And that is the, what people have in their mindset. That Christianity is just about praying. That is all you do. And and those who see it negatively, all they see is you just pray and pray and pray. Nothing ever happens. All you do is pray. The devil's beating on you every time. You're fighting all the time. Your whole life is a struggle. And then they say, you know what? If that is a slave of Jesus, I don't want that. Thank you. My life is going somewhere. I'm not interested in failure. That is what most people think of Christianity. That's what they think of being a slave of Jesus Christ really is. Obviously, they're wrong. Amen? Amen. Basically, what they mean is that God is not enough. I have to be self-dependent. I have to rely upon myself to, do, to be successful. I have to roll up my sleeves and get to work because if I just commit with this church business, that's why you see a lot of, a, a, a lot of married couples, you see the woman goes to church and the man stays at home. Because the man's attitude is normally what? No, I've got to feed my family. I've got to look after my business. I've got to be successful. I've got to make sure that my children are well. I've got to set up a business so that when I get old, I'll be successful. And they ain't got no time for church. They're following Pharaoh. And their whole life becomes a slavery. Because they live for work. What happens, like I always say, when you cross the road and a bus runs you over, what have you achieved? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? You've got to realize, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether you're young, you're old, you're mature, you're men or you're female, it doesn't matter. Even if you own a business, an empire. See, some people, they, you know, you have a normal job, you work a normal hour, and yet you're always busy. But how is it that others who have business empires, every day they can come to church? How can you be so busy? Because you've become a slave. You've become a slave to it. You started to serve that thing, that hope. That is what makes you too busy for God. You think that being a slave of God ain't going to get you nothing. That's not what the Bible says. Let's go through the Bible. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6. Just write that down. You don't need to go to that one. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 says, Not by might, nor by strength, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. You know what? A slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, do you know what they have? You may have your strength, but they've got the strength of the Lord. Amen. See, you may think, I ain't got no time for that Christian stuff because I've got to be strong, I've got to preserve my energy, I've got to work hard. But you're going by your own strength. Whereas a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, they've got the might, the power, the glory, and the strength of the Lord of Heaven's army. The Lord of all creation is behind them. Amen. Which one do you prefer? Amen. Amen. Before you think I ain't got no time, is there some Christians that they can't, they don't even have time to open the Bible. Mm. I got time to worship God. Because I've got to be somebody. Mm. And you get it all wrong. Let's go on to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Uh, let's, yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 28. And after that, you can also write down uh, Philippians chapter 28. Just write these down first before we go to it. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 8. And Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Have you got that down? So Deuteronomy 28, verse 8. Are we there? This is what a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ has. Is everyone there? Amen? Hallelujah? Amen. 
verse 8, the Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouse with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. Verse 9, if you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you um, uh, as his holy people and as he, and, and as he swore he would do. Verse 10, then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord, meaning you are slaves of God. And they will stand in awe of you. They'll be amazed of you. Verse 11. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land he swore to your ancestors to give you. Blessing you with many children, numerous livestock and abundant crop. The Lord will send rain at the proper time from his rich treasury in the heavens. Rain speaks of all manners of blessings. And will bless all the work you do. You will lend to many nations, but you will never need to borrow from them. If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you will always be on top and never at the bottom. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you obey these commands, that's speaking about slavery. A slave must obey his master. Amen? Amen? And it guarantees a blessing, a great blessing. That is the blessing that a slave of the Lord has. But those of you who think that I ain't got no time for this, you have to create your own blessing with your own strength, without the backing of God. All you've got is the promise of Pharaoh and become a slave to it. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, Paul says this, you don't need to go to it, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Again, the slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, I have the strength of Christ. Even when I am weak and I'm tired. Listen, how many times in your dream, every one of you have, have, had, have, have had dreams, you've had hopes, you've planned that something will go well. Maybe you was organizing something on a specific day and you planned that it would just be perfect and then the whole day is ruined. Okay? But Paul says this, I can do all things through Christ. Do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about I can do all things. That means everything, anything that I need, I can do it through Christ because he gives me strength. Amen. That is a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not something for, for, for weaklings or it's not something for failures. Christianity is not this image that people give it that you just have to sit there and turn the other cheek and let you be, you know, you be smacked about. Let the devil, every night the devil's tormenting you. Every day you're struggling with poverty. When someone insults you and spits in your face, you can do nothing about it. That is not what Christianity is about. That is a false representation of being a slave of the Lord. I'm a slave of God. I'm not a slave of the world. If someone smacks me, I'm not their slave that I cannot smack them back. I'm a slave of God. Amen? I don't have to be tormented by the devil. I'm not a slave of him. The Lord is my Lord. Remember what I was talking about? He's the landlord of my body. The devil cannot come and smack me about and I can't do nothing about it. Because he is my God. He is my Lord. He's the one who backs me up. He gives me strength. He opens doors for me. He opens blessing. And I like that. He pulls out uh, from his great treasury rain upon me. Amen. That is the blessings of being a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wrote this down and I just want to read it the way that I was inspired to write it. A slave of God is a world changer. He's blessed in every way. In business, in family, education, even in your career, in your finance, your health, your children, your marriage, your relationship. You are respected. You are successful. You're always a winner. And you are always an achiever. Amen? Amen. It's not about being a failure. Hallelujah. Amen. That is what a Christian's life is. Listen, if my God is powerful, 
then why should I be weak? If my God is rich, why should I be poor? If my God is free, why should I be financially crippled? And there's nothing more evil than being financially crippled. Because you see other people with cars, going on holidays every week, and then you're there still slaving away with the same place, the same job, and never getting anywhere, and praying and not getting nowhere. The secret to that is recognizing I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about time I start taking that seriously. You may still be poor for a little while. You may still lack for a little while. But you know, there's a saying of the world that goes like this. It says, nothing in life is permanent. God promises that there's going to come a time I will bless you. There's going to come a time I will make you the head and not the tail. There will come a time where I will make sure you are at the top and not at the